Benjamin Dowsaw, A Caribbean Thug's Story. Disclaimer. The information presented in this true crime video is based on thorough research and publicly available sources. However, it's important to note that all names, incidents, and events discussed are alleged. While we've made every effort to ensure accuracy, some details may be subject to change as new information emerges. This video is intended for informational and entertainment purposes only, and viewers should exercise their own judgment when evaluating the content. We do not intend to make definitive claims about guilt or innocence, but rather to explore and discuss the various perspectives and theories surrounding the events discussed. Viewer discretion is advised. We are back on the island of St. Lucia, where a well-known individual by the name of Benjamin Dowsaw, who was also known as Benji or Fwet, was gunned down. The ripple effects of which were heart-wrenching. He developed a reputation and earned himself the name Fouet, a play on the French Creole word of cold, which described his nature. Welcome to The Island's True Crime Podcast, where we unveil the skeletons hidden beneath the sand. A true crime podcast for the Caribbean by the Caribbean. If you're joining us for the first time, we hope to see you again. If you've been here before, welcome back. Today, we unravel the heartbreaking tale of the Caribbean thug whose life was cut short just as he decided to live a better life. What went wrong? Let's start from the very beginning. Benjamin Dawson was born on July 10, 1984, in Castries, St. Lucia, where he became one of a family of four that consisted of his mother, one brother, and one sister. Benji's life was ordinary and typical of any city-born child and was filled with memories of family and love. Tragedy struck the family when his mom passed, which caused the three siblings to be separated. This was the beginning of a long battle. Struggling to cope with the void and facing newfound challenges, the young Benji, who was now without parental guidance, sought solace in the streets. The emotional turmoil stemming from the loss of his mother became a driving force, propelling him towards a life where survival often meant resorting to illicit activities. The streets, void of familial warmth, became both a refuge and a background, shaping Benji's trajectory. During his formative years, Benji exhibited an avid interest in cycling and stunt performance, immersing himself in street culture at an early age. Speculation suggested that his involvement in street activities commenced as early as the age of 12, seeing him engaging in altercations, theft, and other nefarious activities as a means of survival. Navigating through elementary school proved to be a struggle for Benji, impeding his entry into a secondary school. Consequently, he was enrolled at the now-defunct Rock Hall Senior Primary School. Yet, Benji's resilience propelled him to overcome the odds and secure admission to one of the island's highly accredited secondary schools, St. Mary's College. Regrettably, his academic journey was curtailed prematurely when he was expelled, cutting short any aspirations of graduation. Under the influence of supposed company and with no proper guidance, his misfortunes started to grow. In his teenage years, with seemingly nothing better to do, his violent streak grew. He was mainly part of the New Village and La Pense areas. In New Village, he found solace with the now-deceased individual by the name of Pookie, who would help him fine-tune his criminal behaviors. The dangerous duo was rumored to be embroiled in a big feud with individuals from Masha and Castries. Benji's reputation as a gunman grew as his name became synonymous with violent crime. This got him the recognition of many dons, not only locally, but also regionally. He aligned himself with the once notorious Playboy Gang from High Street Castries, and found himself implicated in numerous shootings during that time. He was a thorn in the side of his rivals and wouldn't sleep till he annihilated them. He was also engaged in a deadly war with the rival gang from Grass Street's Castries and it's rumored that members of the same rival gang poured acid into Benji's eyes, resulting in him losing vision in one eye. 
which escalated the feud between the two gangs. Benji found himself in Trinidad during a supposed cooling off period, but was recruited by the Lavantil faction of Port of Spain. It's alleged that his time in Trinidad was spent carrying out many nefarious activities, including homicides. He was slowly becoming a hitman for hire and enjoyed the perks that came with his reputation. On his return to St. Lucia, his feud with his rivals continued with multiple shootings and people being lost on both sides. It became almost dangerous to be affiliated with either side. The increased murder rate caused alarm among the citizens and authorities alike. Beben, another one of his monikers, spearheaded his team and was now known as a full-time shooter. It's even rumored that on one occasion, he dressed up as an old woman in an attempt to murder his main rival, Prince, who was the young leader of Grass Street at the time. Unfortunately, another man was inadvertently shot, but survived the ordeal. The feud got so serious that influential citizens had to get involved to stop the bloodshed. They included Dr. Stephen through the nonprofit group Rise St. Lucia, which he led at the time, and the then parliamentary representative of Castri Central, the political constituency to which the rival gangs belonged, Honorable Mr. Richard Frederick. Mr. Frederick's intervention included various peace initiatives, including a peace and love soccer tournament where Benji coached a team. The combined efforts of all involved led to Benji's attempts to reform his life, which saw him turn from a dangerous criminal to a community leader, and he was proud of his newfound role. He was finally given the opportunities he searched for his entire life. With a daughter and son, he devoted his time and energy to doing good so his kids wouldn't have to travel the road he did. He got involved with construction projects and did a few projects across the city. Nonetheless, as the old adage goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. And so, despite his efforts to place more focus on his children and change his life, Benji was still rumored to be involved in some street activities. Fouette After a while, Benji moved to New York. Given his history, it was shocking that he could have acquired a visa, but with no real police record and political favor, he was granted an opportunity that most in his shoes could only dream of. Nonetheless, it's alleged that Benji's sole purpose for going to the US was to carry out a hit. This hit was said to have taken place in Florida, although the details are sketchy. During Bad Ben's time in the US, he found a home with fellow St. Lucian natives who were members of the Fouette crew. These young men formed the group to protect and help each other in the gritty streets of Brooklyn. They were alleged affiliates of the Brooklyn fashion of the Crip Gang and represented the gang's color by dressing in blue attire. Their leader, whom we'll call S, was a native of Otsa, St. Lucia. He formed a construction company and employed his crew to carry out construction contracts as a means of ensuring they were employed and not engaged in criminal activity. By all accounts, S was an honorable man whose main purpose was, and still is, to help other St. Lucians find employment in Brooklyn and care for their families. Benji fit right in with the crew and adopted them as his brothers. Although gainfully employed with the crew and showing much growth and maturity, Benji found it hard to leave old habits behind and was implicated in numerous allegations, including robbing drug dealers and other reprehensible activities around Brooklyn. One notable incident involves a fight between Benji and a guy named Max, who was a St. Lucian from Mabano Castries. We're not sure what caused the conflict, but keep Max in mind as he's an important part of Benji's journey once he returned to St. Lucia. On Benji's return to St. Lucia, he was a seemingly new man with a new persona. He adopted the nickname Fuet, an acronym for F what everyone thinks, and prided himself on his new motorbike. Benji was always known for his daredevil ways from a young boy, and his love for motorbikes only heightened in his adult years as he performed various stunts on the motorbike throughout the streets of Castries and wider St. Lucia, particularly on Chaucey Road with another rider nicknamed Scare. Many also looked forward to Benji performing his stunts during the annual island-wide Independence Day rides. Scare, one of Benji's friends, was a young man from Wilton's Yard Castries, but was known to frequent the community of La Pensee. 
Scare and Benji were quite fond of each other and shared a passion for riding and doing stunts. Sadly, rumors circulated that Benji had set Scare up to be killed after a near-death encounter on his way home one day. But that's for another show. Remember Max from Benji's time in New York? Well, it's rumored that Max was visiting St. Lucia one day when he decided to get his dreads twisted at a hair salon, which was then located upstairs the Cadassay Bakery on the corner of New Village and Chaucey Road in Castries. Remember, New Village was Benji's stomping grounds. It's said that on the day in question, as Max was leaving the salon, a gunman opened fire, hitting him several times. The gunman then took off on foot, running through a ravine and taking a back road out of the neighborhood and into another community called George Villay. Sometime later, Benji appeared on the scene of the crime. Although this case was never solved, Benji was fingered as the alleged trigger man, and it was one of the last murders his name was attached to. After this, things seemed to be going smoothly for Benji until his death. He had his loyal supporters and followers and lived as a neighborhood hero. By this, we mean that Benji was very active in his neighborhood and tried to help out as many people as he could. Whether it was helping the elderly carry groceries, providing financial aid to single mothers, or providing shelter for young men who were kicked out of their homes or had nowhere else to turn to. And as crazy as it sounds, Benji was not one to try to lead kids astray. In fact, he was very strict about every ward going to school and not being on the block during school hours. We also learned that one of his biggest character traits was to defend the weak. Benji was the defender of many of the youths in the New Village and George Valais areas. He would be the first person they called if they were in trouble. He also helped spearhead a truce when the youngsters of these neighborhoods were embroiled in problems with outsiders. He chose his life and made it clear, but knew that many of the youngsters wouldn't be able to bear the pain and paranoia. Benji was also said to be a great father, especially to his son, and made every effort to be a part of his life. So what could have caused a man who was showing signs of maturity and change to die in such a tragic way? There's a common saying that goes, you live by the gun, you die by the gun. And perhaps Karma's sharp sting took this saying a little too literally. 26-year-old Benjamin Dalso was shot to death Tuesday night at Georgeville La Pance, allegedly by a known assailant. On April 27, 2010, Benji's previous misdeeds caught up to him. 26-year-old Benjamin Dalso was shot multiple times on that Tuesday night in the neighborhood of George Valais and Castries after a heated exchange with an individual he grew up with. It's rumored that after a busy day, Benji returned to his neighborhood on his scooter and went to confront his assailant in front of his assailant's home about something that happened earlier in the day. An argument ensued, and threats of murder were uttered by both parties. Like every doomed friendship, the amicable relationship turned sour and tensions ran high. Some neighbors alluded to the fact that there was a hint of jealousy in the air and that Buck, who may have been selling some of these guns to other known dons or bosses, was also a reason why the disagreement occurred. Others suggested that a female may have been at the root of the conflict, and further rumors speculated that the feud may have stemmed from tensions within the neighborhood about who would lead. Buck was fresh from overseas, so the glitz and glamour he came with allured many of the young. Nonetheless, Benji's killer was also a force to be reckoned with, and it seemed that Benji may have underestimated his survival instincts. With Benji's alleged reputation as a killer, his assailant took no chances and opted to approach him with a 9mm gun in hand and began to offload bullets into him. He tried to run, but collapsed in front of a church. How ironic. Benji was rushed to the hospital, but it wasn't fast enough as he was pronounced dead at 1.30 a.m. on Wednesday, April 28, 2010. An autopsy report by the then chief pathologist, Dr. Stephen King, confirmed the cause of death as hemorrhagic shock caused by multiple gunshot wounds. Who was the assailant, you may ask? Allegedly, Kerwin Charles, who is also known as Buck. Buck was born on January 16th and grew up in and frequented the same neighborhoods as Benji and shared a similar reputation. 
Buck spent many years in Canada, where he built a major criminal enterprise, raking up lots of money. He was said to have run an entire apartment complex where illicit narcotics were being sold. On his return to St. Lucia, he built a lovely home for his mom and himself, notwithstanding the number of guns he allegedly brought in with him, with the view to continue his enterprise from home. Benji's death didn't go unpunished, and his loyal followers went to work right after his death, causing some of Buck's family to flee the neighborhood out of fear of retaliation. Their instincts were correct, because hours after the shooting incident, Buck's mother's house mysteriously burned to the ground. A house at La Pance occupied by the alleged murder suspect's mother went up in smoke Wednesday morning, just hours after Dalsaw's killing on Tuesday. Police are probing whether the fire was retribution for the slaying, but fire officials say preliminary results point to arson, prompting an impassioned plea from the prime suspect's distraught mother for protection from possible reprisal. I understood they said they, who they get in the family, who they take, but they didn't say to me. Then they would tell me that. Fortunately, no one was home at the time of the blaze. However, his mother was petrified and lived in fear of further retaliation. She urged her son to surrender to authorities and said that her son and Benji were once close friends, as seen in this clip. It's rumored that Benji's cronies were on the prowl for Buck that same night, but couldn't find him. So they resorted to attacking his properties and family. Again, they may have underestimated Buck's reach, because for one straight week, reprisal shootings were carried out against all those who were said to be involved in the burning of the house. Buck stayed on the run for about a week or two. He was eventually apprehended on a yacht in IGY Rodney Bay Marina. According to court records, Kerwin Charles was first indicted on November 11, 2011, for causing the death of Benjamin Dawson. He entered a not guilty plea. The Crown's entire case was dependent on one witness. In a statement to the police, he initially said he'd known the defendant for about 16 years. He further stated that on the day in question, he was cooling out on the block in George Valet Castries when he heard about eight or nine explosions, which sounded like gunshots. He then saw Benji walking and staggering towards him, holding his stomach. Benji then fell in front of him and said, that man shot me, Charlie, and I feel like dying. However, according to the witness, Benji didn't identify the man who shot him. The witness also said that at the scene, he saw the defendant about 20 feet away coming towards him with a chrome-colored gun clutched in his hand. On seeing this, the witness left the scene and ran away. During a court hearing on March 6, 2013, the witness was evasive. At the witness's request, the court ordered that the police officer who took his statement be present in court to read its contents to him. Unfortunately, the witness remained uncooperative to the extent that the court acceded to an application by the Crown for him to be deemed hostile. Sadly, the sole named witness failed to confirm that he'd seen the defendant approaching him with a weapon. Given that the Crown had no other witnesses, the defendant's counsel requested that court to dismiss the charges against his client and so ended the case of Benjamin Dawson. Benji left a son, a daughter, and many other relatives and friends who mourn him profusely to this day. On the day of his funeral, every gang and most dons and castries were present. His funeral was suited for a king, and the extravagant bike show that followed left onlookers in awe. Buck was released from the Bordelais Correctional Facility after spending two years on remand. He spent some time on the down low, avoiding any reprisals. His name is now synonymous with contract killings, and he was recently shot about eight to nine times in an unrelated incident. In the end, two criminals went head to head and a life was lost. We can't validate who's right or wrong, seeing as the victim was the aggressor on the day in question. What we can say is that this senseless killing could have been avoided and both men, who were fathers, brothers, sons, and uncles, could have coexisted in peace. This chapter ends with a tiny lesson. The modern world is scary, and even the slightest argument might result in a fatal death. Let's teach emotional intelligence and problem resolution to the current youth to prevent similar occurrences in the future. Let's start by creating better environments for our kids 
so they don't get exposed and influenced by thugs, wars, and guns. We extend our condolences to the family and friends of Benjamin Dawson. Please, let's find a way to reduce crime. And again, please stop the violence now.